that doesn't stir you just a little bit, you might want to go ahead and check the polls. I'm not sure, because that was, that was beautiful, Rosemary. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It is good to see you. It is good to have you here in God's house on God's day with God's people. Can you say amen? Amen. Thank you so much. I missed you. <laughs> I hope you missed me. Actually, I hope everything went just fine without me, because that is truly my goal, is things are just as good when I'm not here as when I am here. Uh, but I appreciate, first and foremost, the opportunity to take a week off, to renew myself, to have a little time with my family, and I trust that Maddie uh, took great care of you, and I know Dave was on point for pastoral care calls, and so I just appreciate everybody and do all, do all the things that you all do to make um, my time away possible. It was a fruitful time. I won't say it was an incredibly relaxing time, but it was a very fruitful time for me and for the family, and we just appreciate that time of renewal. So this morning, uh, announcements uh, as we get started today. Uh, a couple of things, just as a reminder, um, we have our station set up at the back for giving opportunities, including a glass mission mug back there. So if you've got some pocket change, you want to drop it in that mug. That is specifically to do our mission works or help along with our mission works that we do. We'd encourage you to uh, express your generosity in that way as well. And other announcements. I'm probably out of the loop, so tell me what's going on that we need to be aware of. This Saturday is the ice cream of the How, how? The 26th. 26th. So, isn't that this Saturday? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is this Saturday. It is this Saturday, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I'm glad somebody's awake, because it's not me. Um, this coming Saturday, um, we are having our parish ice cream social. So typically our parish does two events through the summer and fall, one of which is an ice cream social and fundraiser um, where we pick a mission uh, opportunity that we want to support. And um, we also typically do a revival. Um, and so with COVID being, well, COVID, we decided this year, instead of trying to put on two events, we really needed to shift our focus and so saturday we are doing we're calling it chords and cones we've got some wonderful musicians coming it's going to be an island park in which in winfield so we have um, outdoor activity where hopefully the weather is going to be beautiful for us we're anticipating that it might and we'll have some wonderful musicians um including the butler brothers if, if you are, are familiar with them and the other band the gas band, thank you. Um, so some wonderful musicians that are well known in this area that do a lot of performing that people uh, enjoy. And uh, all the money that we raise from that event by donation, because there's no entry fee, it's just come and, and, and gift, uh, gifts of free will. Um, well, we're, we're supporting something that's near and dear to my heart. Most of you probably already know. I serve on the board of directors for the uh, Winfield Correctional Facility um, Spiritual Life Center. We don't have a good dedicated space to do the work of prison ministry down there, and so we are attempting to raise some money to build a building, to build a facility that will be dedicated for the spiritual well-being of those inmates. And so, um, truly, we would uh, love you to come, enjoy the music, support that work. It's a great mission. And uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun, I think. And yours truly will be um, MCing. So uh, that's a thing. So if you wanna just come see me make a fool of myself, that's a perfectly good reason to come too. Um, but come for the great music and uh, help support this wonderful cause. And uh, it, it's all because of our, our network within the Sunflower Parish, our four churches that are connected together making these sorts of events happen. So we appreciate that connection. So in, in case you didn't catch that, um, Swans has generously offered um, for a very nominal fee. They're going to be there to um, take care of our ice cream needs so that we have ice cream that's individually packaged and individually individual servings so that we don't have to worry about um, uh, individuals touching and serving and sharing. And so like that's going to be a huge thing for us. And then the only other thing is we're asking for cookies or brownies. If you'd like to donate, there's a sheet to sign up. Is that in your office, Meryl, or where should they find that? 
out here in the uh, out, out here in the uh, the foyer, you'll find a, a clipboard if you'd like to sign up to um, to, to help us uh, have some of those other treats. Um, we ask then that they're individually wrapped um, in, in Ziploc bags. So again, we're just trying to be thoughtful and um, and, and as uh, prepared as we can be, knowing that this time is difficult, but um, we don't want to lose all sense of normalcy. And it, it felt very much. The parish council was was very much in favor of we don't want to miss out on the opportunity to serve in this way that we do annually and let's do it responsibly and, and ethically so um there we are other announcements for the body this morning joe yeah. It does. It does. I noticed that as I was pulling up this morning. I don't know who it was, but bless you, um, because our uh, garden beds needed a little uh, tender, loving care, and uh, it's not been top priority as we've been dealing with other things. And so appreciative to whoever spent the time and the uh, and the elbow grease to to get that done for us. Thank you so much. Other things we should bring for the body this morning. If not, then I would invite you to stand as you are able and comfortable and join in our call to worship on the screen. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. Amen. Uh, if you would be seated then, as you would, I'm just going to read from the screen this morning, why not? Our Old Testament reading comes to us from the Psalms this morning, the 105th Psalm, verses 1 through 6, and 37 through 45. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. He brought out Israel laden with silver and gold, and from among their tribes no one faltered. Egypt was glad when they left. Because of dread of Israel, because dread of Israel had fallen on them. He spread out a cloud as a covering and a fire to give light that night. They asked, and he brought them quail. He fed them well with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed like a river in the desert, for he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for, that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Our hymn on this morning is Give Thanks.
Would you join me now in our opening prayer? Gracious Creator God, we come to you this morning with praise on our lips, and we pray that you bring us ears that are open to hear, minds that are open to learn, and hearts that are open to listen for your word and your, your desire for us and the call you have for our lives. Lord, let all these things be done in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning comes to us from the book of Philippians, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound upon account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We need prayer. Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, God, are our rock and our strength and our redeemer. Amen. People of Grandview, I, I trust that you all managed things without me for a week. And again, I want to reiterate that I'm so very thankful that you provided me with the time to reorder my thoughts and renew my spirit. As many of you already know, one of my goals last week was to prepare some assignments that I have due for my course of study work which moved me toward my ultimate goal of ordination as an elder in the United Methodist Church. I had four large textbooks to read and four papers to write on those texts. This is all considered pre-work or called advanced assignments that have to be turned in before the actual start of the course coming up in October. But don't pity me, because I was able to engage in thought and study in ways that I well, simply haven't made time for in a while. It was good. One of the gifts of this process was that I found in the footnote of one of the books a reference to a sermon written by the Reverend Harry Emerson Fosdick in 1941. Now, Reverend Fosdick was ordained in 1903 at the Baptist Church, in the Baptist Church, excuse me, and was quickly promoted to a position at Union Theological Seminary in 1911. Reverend Fosdick was sort of revolutionary in his day. He staunchly rejected fundamentalism and Calvinism, which he believed produced, quote, a god who is a devil. He was known in theological circles as the Jesse James of theologians. One biographer wrote of him that he was, quote, the most influential interpreter of religion to his generation. Well, that's high praise indeed, but it wasn't his credentials that drew me to his sermon. It was, in fact, the title of the sermon quoted in the text that got my attention. The sermon was titled, God Talks to the Dictator. Just to put it into perspective into the conversation, Reverend Fosdick was ordained in the years leading up to the First World War. 
When he wrote this text, we were tumbling headlong into the World War II. While I recognize that our particular set of circumstances in 2020 are objectively different than her, his were in 1941, I do find some distinct parallels between then and now. As we gather this morning, our sun is partially dimmed by the haze of fires which ravage the western states. Unrest is boiling over. Wealth and income inequality continue to move to record points. Justice and mercy have become ideals that we simply give lip service to on Sundays and behave in ways which look in no way just or merciful. My friend Reverend Fosdick makes in his text a case that America, and indeed all the free democracies of the world, had become just like Israel had, just before the Assyrians decimated them, at the hand of a dictator. So I would invite you this morning to listen to these words and see if they stir in you in some of the same ways that they stirred in me. This is not the first time in history that the world has faced the military conquests of dictators. Long ago, a Hebrew prophet lived through an era like ours when his people were assailed by the Assyrians, but unlike most of us, he achieved a standpoint from which to view the scene that was distinctive of his religious prophethood. He heard God talking to the dictator. Granted that in an absolute and literal sense, no man can know what God would say to anyone. Yet this is one of man's distinctive attributes, that he can erect himself higher than himself and see the situations that confront him, not simply from a level of stance, but from above, as they might look to God. That is what a prophet is for to help people see their contemporary world in wide perspective from a height as God might see it. So Isaiah heard God talking to the dictator. Quote, the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, unquote, so that Judea lay under the thraldom of a conqueror. And in distress and confusion, as among us now, everyone was talking about him and to him. But history has taught us, thought it worthwhile to record only what the prophet heard God say to him. Ho, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, the staff in whose hand is mine indignation. The Jews hated that conqueror. He seemed to them altogether wild and lawless. He threatened their temple and their culture. His victory meant to them the downfall of their choicest values. He was to them anti-God, as though some volcanic evil, some demonic force had escaped from God's control and was running amok in the world. They felt about him as we feel about Hitler. Then Isaiah heard God talking to him, calling him, as Dr. Moffat translates it, my club in anger, the rod I wield in wrath. So that dictator was not merely wild and lawless. He had not escaped the sovereignty of God. He was a rod in God's hands. God had picked him up. God was using him. God could lay him down again. The dictator himself did not know this, says Isaiah. Other plans has he and other aims. But even amid his devastations, God talked to him as though to say, you are my instrument, I am using you, I took you up, and I can throw you down. Like all typical religious language, this is picturesque metaphor and simile. We may not interpret it to mean that God uses evil means to do good ends. In two ways we deal with evil, sometimes choosing it as a method, as Jesus' enemies chose his crucifixion to secure a result they wanted, sometimes confronting it as Jesus himself confronted the cross, not choosing it, but forced to face it, and turning it to the purposes of man's salvation. 
The choice of evil for good ends is always wrong. The use of evil when it is thrust upon us, the high purpose, is one of the noblest forms of moral victory. It is in the second category, not the first, that we should place Isaiah's vision of God as he says to the Assyrian conqueror, you are my rod. In the first place, Isaiah saw God using that conqueror as a just punishment on Judea for its sins. O oh, Assyrian, the rod of my anger. That was a dreadful thing for the prophet to have to say to his own people, but he said it. He was like a faithful psychiatrist dealing with one of us when we blaze out with indignation against someone who we think is wronging us. For the psychiatrist says, wait a moment, that was your own fault. You brought that on yourself. So Isaiah spoke to the people. They suffered their tragedy, he said, because they deserved it. Unless we can see that truth about ourselves today, I am sure we have missed one of the major meanings of our catastrophe. We brought this disaster upon ourselves. As a matter of historic fact, it was only by giving that interpretation to the conquerors that the Jewish prophets achieved the monotheism that they have bequeathed to us. For in those days, the theory was that there were many gods, each nation having its own deities. And the theological question then was which nation's gods were most real and most powerful. Well, the answer to that polytheistic question was naturally made evident in war. If one nation conquered another, clearly the gods of the conquerors were the real and the strong, and the gods of the conquered weak. So when Assyria triumphed over Judea, the popular conclusion was swift and clear. The gods of Assyria must be real, the gods of Israel must be beautiful. Monotheism could never have come from that interpretation of the conqueror. The great prophets gave us monotheism because they saw the conqueror from another point of view. They said not that he disproved the one true God, but that he represented the inevitable punishment of the one true God on his people's sin. The victory of Assyria was to the prophets not evidence of God's weakness or abdication, but of God's terrific reality as the impartial administrator of ethical cause and consequence. The one God of Israel, they cried, is still the God of all the people of the world, but he is a God of moral law. Not even a chosen people can escape his punishments. When then the Assyrian conquered Judea, and all the people were tempted to cry, that proves the gods of Assyria to be real, the prophet said rather, that proves that we have sinned. And that the eternal God of righteousness plays no favors in this world, but brings down his judgment even on Judea when she rebels. As a matter of historic fact, that is the way we got monotheism. From prophets penitent enough to acknowledge that their catastrophe was the one God's punishment on their own people's sin. And that is not ancient history. Some today say that Hitler and Mussolini proved that the gods of Nazism and fascism are the true gods. Others say that these conquerors, with their cruel devastations, prove there is no god at all. The prophetic vision is needed afresh to see that what the dictators really prove is that we have all sinned. That this is a morally law-abiding world that cause does bring consequence. That God cannot be mocked, and that what we sow, we reap. That our present tragedy is the inevitable result of our joint guilt. There are many things in these troubled days that the church cannot do to help. But some things are the church's special business, and none, I think, more crucial and important than to keep penitence alive in this situation. Said a wise friend to me recently, if all of us could go to the council table after this war is over, in the spirit of penitence, there might be some hope. Well, without that, there can be no hope at all. 
Moreover, we of the democracy should be especially penitent. We want the last war. With utter and crushing completeness, we want it. Never forget that. Endure, if you can, the reading of one paragraph from President Wilson's announcement on the Armistice, Armistice to Congress in 1918. We know that the object of the war is attained, the object on which all free men have set their hearts, and attained with a sweeping completeness which even now we do not realize. Armed imperialism such as the men conceived who were but yesterday the masters of Germany is at an end. Its illicit ambitions engulfed in black disaster. Who will now seek to receive it? The arbitrary power of the military caste of Germany, which once could secretly and of its own single choice disturb the peace of the world, is discredited and destroyed. And more than that, much more than that, has been accomplished. So completely did we, the democracies, win the war. We were in charge of the world. We could do what we wanted. As what we did and did not do, the Bill of Particulars has been written again and again, and I know no judgment more unanimous than this, that we of the democracies are more responsible for the rise of the dictators than the plain people of the dictatorships themselves. Penitence becomes us well. There are many angles from which one can look at Hitler and Mussolini today. I am not denying the truth in any of them, but they are partial and incomplete unless we humbly and penitently recognize that the dictators have come as an inevitable consequence of our joint sin. Unless we hear, as it were, the moral order of this universe talking to them, saying, Oh, Assyrian, the rod of mine, the anger. Now, such penitence is not at home in wartime. In wartime, pride is at home. Today, pride rules our wills. In picking out sin and distributing blame, we practice selective attention. We can easily see the inequities of everyone except ourselves and our friends. We Christians should do better than that. As Lincoln did during the Civil War, I commend his spirit to you. Quote from Lincoln. If God wills that all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and every drop of blood with, drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, still it must be said the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. We just don't talk like that anymore. In the second place, however, this address of God to the dictator implies another meaning. Namely, that God is employing the dictator to some good purpose of his own when the populace upon the common level saw the conqueror's victory. They cried, all is lost. But the prophets did not. God had picked up that rod of Assyria, they said, and would do not home, do something with it before he laid it down. They found that is not only humility and penitence, penitence but courage and hope in the sovereignty of God. There is a strange verse in one of the Psalms addressed to the Lord, which says, The wrath of man shall praise thee. How can that be true? It says, God can take the man's evil and use it, that in his hands every man's wrath and iniquity are not a total loss. It says that God can use downright sin as though a piece of grit that did not belong there. Getting into an oyster shell. The oyster could make into a pearl after all. How can that be true about sin? Yet, where would we be in personal life if that were not true? When a man sins, need that be a total loss? No, not necessarily a total loss. It may seem dangerous for a preacher to give that answer, but it is the true one. Even downright wickedness need not be a total loss. Did that prodigal son for example, or nothing in the far country that God could put to good use afterwards? 
He learned a lot that boys who stay at home never know. It was dreadful. Only a fool would go through what he went through for the sake of learning it. But when, in after days, some boys was tempted to seek the far country, who was it in that Jewish town that best could help him? Well, that prodigal. He knew he could put his very sin to use for the sake of God and of that other boy now tempted. We are often told that we ought to capitalize on our troubles and transform them into sympathy, understanding, and increased usefulness. That is true also about our sin. Here it is. A great mistake. A wrong committed. It is a loss, but thank God it need not be a total loss. Capitalize upon it. There are some people we especially can help because of it. God can use it. He can make even the wrath of men praise him, as the psalmist said. Even unredeemed sinner God's, God uses. We constantly and rightly exalt the ways in which God has used Christ, his perfect instrument. Yes, because he has used Judas Iscariot, too. Someone, I suppose, had to try that experiment of betraying Christ and stand there, an example of the way such betrayal looks when it's seen in the retrospect of history. How many of us, then, in some pinch in our own lives, when we have been tempted to betray Christ, have thought of Judas? And have said, no, not that. I'll not do that. See, God can even use Judas. I am pleading for what our fathers called an overruling providence. As though man's wickedness, like a stream, could indeed go wild, break its banks, and let loose some torrential flood. But lo, there is a lie of the land that gets control in the end. A limit beyond which no stream's wildness can go. A contour to the landscape. A shape to the eternal hills. A declivity in the valleys. That at last bring even the wildest streams to terms. And force them into channels that they did not choose. The fact about the world the great prophet saw. O Assyria. As a matter of history, this has been true in man's public affairs. The Roman Empire was vast imperialism, cruel, selfish, and bloody. Was it a total loss? Well, far from it. God uses Rome for an overriding of racial and national boundaries, a unifying of the known world, a creative building of law and of order to which we are still incalculably indebted. The French Revolution was terrible with tumbrils rolling down Parisian streets and heads falling daily between the guillotine. Was it a total loss? Far from it. In the retrospect of history, it left gains that cannot be measured. Hitler and Mussolini represent everything that most we fear and hate in public life. Will they be a total loss? Not unless history reverses itself. My friends, a radical change in the world order has been long overdue. Our military and economic imperialisms, our subjugation of native peoples, our insane tariff barriers, our unjust division of the world's resources have long cried out for change. We, the democracies, might have done it peacefully. But alas, we failed. Now the dictators come. They are to me as terrible as they are to you, but be sure of this. In the retrospect of history, they will not be a total loss. God is saying to them today, Ho, Assyria, my rock. Indeed, has it not occurred to us that Hitler may turn out to be a powerful, even though unintentional, friend of democracy? For consider, we in the democracies were slipping. Indeed, we were. We were taking democracy for granted. Was it not a lovely way of living that our fathers had bequeathed to us? What we could get out of it, not what we should dedicate to it, was the foremost in our thoughts. Our life in this country had become undisciplined, soft, indulgent, careless, and what we took so easily for granted we had forgotten deeply and sacrificially to value. 
but now democracy is in danger. And there has been in the United States more care about it, more study of what it means, more concern over its foundations, more sense to its values than the last year, than in many a year before. Alas, we never value anything as we should until we face the peril of losing it. This is true even in the family, who's, where some loved person who for years has been safely at our side, who has been assumed as part of our scenery of our life, falls ill. And we wake up to see how carelessly we have been talk taking for granted the one whom we easily might lose. So today we feel about our democracy. It has become to us very much a dear thing. We have faced the possibility of seeing democracy crushed. We have said that democracy should not die as long as free spirits were left in the world. Who has wrought this change? Hitler. What then? Am I saying thank God for Hitler? Far from it. But thank God for God, who towers above Hitler, who can use him despite himself for causes that he has no mind to serve. Thank God for that lie of the land that no overflowing flood can ultimately escape, but that will turn the wildest currents to channels that they cannot, they but God chooses. See what I am pleading for, faith in the God of history. Throughout my ministry, two aspects of God have been predominant in my thought and preaching, the God of nature and the God of interpersonal experience. But in these days, another aspect of deity grows imperative, the God of history not to be identified with any national policy, not even with our own. The God of history sitteth above the circle of the earth, and the nations are accounted as a drop in the bucket. And there he is today, and his word to the dictators has not lost its power. O oh, Assyrian, my rod. This leaves us a brief moment for the final truth involved in the prophet's insight. When God picks up a rod, he can throw it down again. He always has. These rods of his, these conquerors that seem so strong, one by one have been thrown down. God picked them up. Well then, shall the axe boast itself against him that he with, she with therewith? Shall the saw magnify itself, him that wieldeth it? One of the great passages in Victor Hugo's Les Mis is his description of the Battle of Waterloo. Recall how it ends. Was it possible for Napoleon to win the battle? We answer in the negative. Why? On account of Wellington? On account of Blucher? No, on account of God. When the earth is suffering from an excessive burden, there are mysterious groans from the shadow, which the abyss hears. Napoleon had been denounced in infantude, and his fall was decided. He had angered God. Napoleon himself had an intimation of this fact, for he said once, As long as I am necessary, no power in the world will be able to brush me aside. But the moment I become unnecessary, an atom will be enough to smash me. I am not saying that in this grim crisis that confronts the world, we can shoulder off on God all the responsibility of getting rid of the conquerors, as though he would settle everything. We have our tasks, many and imperative, to make these dictators unnecessary and impossible. But if we are to have strength for them, we need to see and hear not than the daily, more than the daily news brings to our eyes and ears. Not we humans alone. But God is also talking to the dictators. And in the broad perspective of history, it is not too difficult to discover what he is saying. Ho, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. He is saying that. I am urging you, and far beyond your will, you will serve my purposes and not be a total loss. He is saying that. But he is saying also, when I am through with you, you are done. No wild stream, however madly grows turbulent, can in the end escape the lie of my land. Ah, Christ, how utterly different 
you are from the dictators. How weak today you often seem in comparison with them. Yet, the long perspectives of history suggest another judgment. He ends with a poem. The poem is titled The Conquerors by Harry Kemp. I saw the conquerors riding by with trampling feet of horse and men. Empire on empire, like the tide, flooded the world and ebbed again. A thousand banners caught the sun and cities smoked along the plain. Laden down with silk and gold and heaped up pillage groaned the wane. I saw the conquerors riding by, splashing through loathsome floods of war, the crescent leaning over its host and the barbaric scimitar. And continents of moving spears and storms of arrows in the sky and all the instruments sought out by cunning men that men may die. I saw the conquerors riding by with cruel lips and faces wan, musing on kingdoms sacked and burned. There rode the Mongol Genghis Khan. And Alexander, like a god, who sought to wield the world in one, and Caesar with his laurel wreath, and like the thing from hell, the Hun, and leading like a star the band, heedless of upstretched arm and groan, indestructible Napoleon went dreaming of empire and alone. Then all they perished from the earth as fleeting shadows from a glass, and conquering down the centuries came Christ, the swordless, on an ass. Friends, there is good news. As Reverend Fosdick said, as he said, pleading for an overruling providence through hu though humans' wickedness like a stream could indeed be go wild. Friends, in other words, the God of all times shapes all times. There is no force which overpowers God. Let us look to Christ, the swordless, for our hope. And remind ourselves that our hope is not in a politician, is not in a political party, or military might, or even our beloved democratic republic. No, all of these institutions have failed us time and again. So then, let us be as zealous for the justice and mercy and holiness of God as we are for all these other powers we misplace our hope in. See, perhaps a day will come when we see as many yard signs and mailers which lift the glory of God's promise as we do political ones. And perhaps then God may spare the rod. And until then, we pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That was long, and it was hard, and it gave me such hope, because I have felt a lot of hopelessness recently. The God of all creation, there is no river that can run outside of the banks that he will not eventually bend towards the ocean. There is hope if we place our trust and hope in God. Join me now as we read our common confession, as we recognize that we indeed fall short and we place our hope in the wrong things. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, hear this amazingly good news this morning. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. 
And that absolutely proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Creator, we come to you this morning grateful for the opportunity to gather for you, the opportunity to be with one another, the opportunity to lean into our understanding and our walks with you. Lord, please allow us to lift all the things that we have shared and all the ones that went unspoken this morning. Let us lift these to you and entrust them in your care and know that you walk alongside us as we journey our paths. Lord, we do all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I normally at this point say it passes too quickly, and if it didn't today, that's my fault. But uh, I was inspired by the words, and I appreciate uh, you all giving me the time to go and do some of this study, to do some of this deep leaning into my own understanding and my own walk that I don't get to do when I'm in my normal everyday patterns. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, indulging me even though you didn't really have a choice. I've kind of held you captive here and that's okay. So, go now. Go with the peace, the justice, the mercy of God the creator, God the renewer, the God of judgment, the God of mercy, Go and serve and bring the love of Christ Jesus to all peoples. Amen. Amen.